2 Samuel chapter 10. If you'll remember with me in our last chapter, we had Mephibosheth. Um, Mephibosheth come and he was Jonathan's son. And Jonathan means Yahweh given. And the son of uh, Jonathan is uh, like a grace of God, the favor of God. And we see the kindness of God from David the king. He wants to show it to Jonathan's household as opposed to killing all of the, the uh, previous king's um, heirs. He wants to make you a joint heir. It's a type of Christ. He could kill all the children of the devil and he would have to kill all of creation because we're all born under sin. But Christ chooses to make you a joint heir with him. He chooses to restore you to the place you were before with God, like Adam and Eve in the garden. And he chooses you to eat at his table continually, the same way he did with Mephibosheth. He, he restored him and had somebody else work his land, but then he brings Mephibosheth to his table and lets him eat there continually. It's Revelation 3.20, if you will, when Christ says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone will open the door, I will come in and dine with him and he with me. And we eat at the Lord's table forever. Look what it says there in the last verse of chapter 9. It's really amazing. It's verse 13, isn't it? So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem. We will dwell in the new Jerusalem eventually. For he ate continually at the king's table, and he was lame in both feet. Again, the reminder, before it said he was lame in his feet, it didn't say both feet. Very important that we understand that right now you actually have two, you actually have two feet. But you also have two natures. And you can choose to live in the flesh, or you can choose to walk in the spirit. And you can choose either one of those. However, when we sat one day in the New Jerusalem at the table with the Lord forever, we won't have the flesh anymore. All we will be is just lame in both feet, and we will be like Christ. Our flesh will be gone. It will be all about Jesus and doing His will and eating with Him continually. Um, and He is the bread of life. We should do that now to grow and grow and grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So remember this. What was it? It was the children of Saul, who was a type of rejected king, a type of Satan, and Jonathan, and then down to Mephibosheth. And the future king, or the king who's on the throne now, type of Christ, offers kindness, which means favor, or it means the goodness of God. And that's what leads us to repentance. Repentance is a change of mind. It's a change of direction. So God gives us kindness and goodness and his grace and we change our directions and we stop eating at the table of Belial. We stop eating at the table of the devil. We stop eating at the table of the world and we come and we eat at the table of God continually and he gives us new life through it and a new heart and a new hope and a new home in it positionally and then practically as we abide and continue and remain. And so Chapter 10 continues with this same theme, amazingly, as we see David, who is a type of Christ, he's going to offer kindness to another enemy, to another person who's under the curse. Now listen to me, because you're going to see this in the scriptures. There's those who receive the kindness and the goodness of God, and they abide and continue and remain at his table, and they dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. And there's those who reject it and listen to liars and false teachers, and they're afraid to receive grace and mercy and the food from the Lord's table, and they're afraid to trust him. Listen to me. Because here we have it again. And it happened, this is a transition statement, after this, that the king of the people of Ammon died. Anybody know who the people of Ammon are? The Ammonites? We've seen them before. Remember Lot's incestuous relationship in Genesis 19? 
Ben Ami is the father of the Ammonites. Here is a people that's under a curse. Ammon, they're under a curse. Just like we are born under a curse. And Christ takes our curse for us. How does he do it? He dies on a cross and raises it again. And then he shows his kindness toward us. And he says, hey, wake up. I died for you. And if you believe that in your heart and confess it with your mouth, that Jesus is Lord and God raised you from the dead, you can be saved. But you can reject that kindness. You can reject that grace. You can reject that favor. The people of Ammon, the king of the people of Ammon, notice we're going to see his name in verse 2, died, and Hanan, his son, reigned in his place. I want you to see this. Hanan means favored. Isn't that what grace is? Favored. Listen, listen to me. It's very important that we understand this. When Christ died, it's good for your theology of the New Testament, when Christ died, he died for everybody under the curse, whomsoever, anyone. He says, come to me, all you. Don't come up with any New Testament theology that says he didn't die for everyone. We just seen him and Mephibosheth believed and received the kindness. Now we're going to see this one, Amon, uh, an incestuous relationship with Lot and his daughter. And, and, and they were cursed. The Moabites was the other, uh, uh, his son Moab, and now the Ammonites. And they've all been offered the grace of God, the goodness of God. They've been offered redemption. They've been offered this kindness from the king. Hanan means favored. See, that favor is given to every person ever born because Christ died for whomsoever. Are you with me here? Don't get lost. 2 Corinthians 5.15 says he died for all. All. How much is all? Get a calculator out, somebody. It's all. He didn't die just for the elect or some, which some will teach. His son reigned in his place. Then David, David means um, beloved David means loving. It's from the word to love. Then love said, I will show kindness, favor. I will show goodness to Hanan. He means favored. The son of, here's the king that died, Nahash. Guess what Nahash means? Snake, serpent. See, the rejected king Saul is dead. The devil has been crushed and defeated. He no longer <coughs> reigns on the earth. He's, he's out on bond. Listen to me. But he no longer has the title deed anymore. Christ does. And there's a time where he's pouring out his favor on all those who are cursed. And he's given them a choice to choose who? To choose you and I. To choose that grace. We are the ambassadors, though, that the king sends. Watch this. Nahash means snake or serpent. He's the king that died of the people that were cursed. And his son, who reigned in his place, was even given a favor from God, kindness from God. And, show, and, the father, and it says, and his father showed kindness to me. This is what David said. Because David had tried to make friends when he was out there running from Saul. When he was the future king, he tried to make friends and was out there and Nahash must have showed kindness to David. So David sent by the hand of his servants. He sent ambassadors, right? Isn't that who we are? Ambassadors for Christ? As if God was pleading through us, be reconciled to God. He sent from the hand of his servants to comfort, to console him concerning his father and David's servants came into the land of the people of Ammon, the people who were cursed. And the princes of the people of Ammon said to Hanan, said to the favored, their Lord, do you think that David, do you think that love really honors your father because he has sent comforters to you? Isn't that amazing what we're looking at? Does anybody see that? 
The comforters, the Holy Spirit is sent to us. The ambassadors are sent to us. We have the word of reconciliation that we take to those who are underneath the curse. Listen, you don't have to listen to your father who is dead now, the devil. You don't have to listen to the serpent or the snake and the lies of this world. There's favor. Christ has died and rose again. And he's given us favor. He's given us grace. And you can listen and you can receive his comfort. You can receive his ambassadors. This is the word of reconciliation. Verse 3. And the princes, these princes I believe are demons and familiar spirits. Here they're real people that were counseling Hanan. And listen, you can get that from some false teachers. You get counsel from false teachers. They will tell those that are favored by God and it could receive the grace of God things that are lies. They'll have you back under the law. They'll have you back under your rules. They'll have you back chasing falsehoods and believe in bad doctrine. The princes of the people of Ammon, the princes of those who are under a curse, said to the favor of their Lord. Do you think that David, that love really honors your father because he sent comfort, con consolation to you? Has David not rather sent these ambassadors, his servants to you to search the city, to spy it out and to overthrow it? So now you got to understand, this is a real city. This is a real place. I've, I'm reading into the text. Sometimes I can maybe uh, um, distract that, that is, this is a real place here. It's the real enemy that could attack later on David. And he is defeating all the enemies around him. He's trying to make peace with everybody. Listen, we were enemies with Christ. We were, we were enemies of God. And in Christ, Romans 5.1 tells us, we can now have peace. We can have peace with God through the blood of Jesus Christ. And David, the king, is offering peace to the enemies. And then there's other princes, there's demons, I believe, false, false teachers, familiar spirits that's counseling this one who has been favored by God. Because listen to me, it's a whomsoever gospel. And there's people out there lying to people to keep them from believing in the grace of God and the favor of God and coming to the king. And people will listen to that bad counsel. That's why it's so important for you and me to be out there with the word of reconciliation. To be out there giving witness to the grace of God and walking it out in front of them. And then telling them the truth of the gospel. Because of so many liars. So many liars. Therefore, verse 4. Because of these princes and this bad counsel and these lies. Who's the father of all lies? John. <laughs> Satan. I don't mean Satan that. is the father uh. of all lies. Satan is the one who tells the lie. Satan is the spiritual force behind. Remember we just learned in the memory verse, we're not to regard anybody as flesh anymore. We're supposed to understand that the devil wants to interrupt all truth. And he wants to distort it. And he wants to change it. And he wants us to miss the favor of God and the grace of God so that we can have the peace of God and rest with God for eternity. Because he sent counsel. He sent comfort. He, he's, already, he's already paid for it completely. But there's a lot of people that will distort it. <laughs> Therefore, Hanan, the one who's favored, took David's servants took love servants. Look at this. Shaved off half of their beards, cut off their garments in the middle at their buttocks, and sent them away. Now, it's very important that we get this all together. See, when they would defeat a person, they would march them off with their buttocks showing. I don't know if you guys know it, but in our culture today, it's real cool to let your butt show, let your pants sag. I don't know how it became cool, because it's a sign of being defeated. It's a sign of being uh, under slavery and, and defeated by somebody else. And we've turned it into something else when you show your buttocks. So anyway, listen, a beard was a sign of authority and maturity in this culture. It's authority and maturity. 
And the devil wants to counsel us to give up our garments, half of our garment. Where do we get a new garment from? Christ. We're clothed in Christ. We have his garment of righteousness on. The, the devil wants to lie to us. He wants us to give up our authority. He wants to shame us. When Christ took all of our guilt and our shame, he took the power and the penalty of sin, and we're free in Christ, and we can go out and tell people the truth, and they can't do nothing about it. If they kill us, we go to be with Christ. Listen to me. But the enemy, with his counsel and with his deeds, he wants to cut our authority and our garment of righteousness in half. He doesn't want to walk. He doesn't want us to walk in total freedom. He doesn't want us to walk in the newness of life. He doesn't want us to live for Christ freely and have that authority that God has given us. All authority has been given to me. Go. He's given us his authority to go. Not half of his authority, all of his authority. He's clothed us in righteousness, not half of his righteousness, all of his righteousness. But the enemy wants to cut us in half. He Actually, to, Satan's the father of all lies. I just you're fine. See if you're fine. Yeah. You're fine. <laughs> Everybody knows that. <laughs> so, listen to me. When we live half in the world and half in the church, when we're wearing half a beard, half authority, and half a garment, the enemy is defeating us. He's taking us captive. Look what happens. You become greatly ashamed. Verse five. When they told David, he sent to meet them. So there must have been some, uh, some people going back and forth because the men were greatly ashamed. And the enemy wants to cause shame. Confess your sin and he forgives you and you're cleansed from all unrighteousness. There should be some humility, but there doesn't have to be any shame. The enemy. The enemy tries to steal their authority and tries to steal uh, uh, their maturity, tries to steal their clothing in righteousness in Christ. And so uh, they, they, he, the king tells them, wait in Jericho. Jericho means moon city until your beards have grown and then return. Now they can put the garment back on, but their authority has to, or their appearance and their beard takes a little bit of time, doesn't it? And, and again... Um, it's interesting that the beard, I don't know if they cut their beard like half the side of the face. I don't know. I don't know how they did that. I would assume that they might have just cut it off, but they could have cut it right down the middle and left half their face. I had a buddy that did that once. He went up to shave and he came back down and just had half his mustache on, was walking around. He wanted to see how long it would take people to notice that he was just being goofy. But listen, how often are we walking around defeated how often are we walking around in shame how often are we walking around naked before god because we're not surrendering we're not going with authority we're not going to those that he's called us to go to is it because of others i mean listen when i go to somebody to share the gospel if they don't receive it it's not my fault it's not my fault I still have authority to go back to them. I still have authority to go to other people. All we have to do is go. All we're called to do is share the word of reconciliation. You don't lose any of your authority or lose any of your maturity. You don't lose those things. You're gaining those things as you go. So they wait in Jericho. Now, how many notice Jericho? Just a sidebar. I thought it was destroyed. I thought it was dead too. I'm just like, I don't know. Maybe it's, maybe they're just right at the place where Jericho was tore down or maybe. They rebuilt and, it. Well, they did rebuild it. They, they, they actually had two Jerichos. Yeah. They rebuilt it and the guy gave up his firstborn and then he hung the doors with his, with his other child. Yeah. Um, but I, maybe it's timelined after Jericho was rebuilt too. Um, so I have to search that out. But I'm just saying, that's the first time I've seen Jericho since it was destroyed. And in, in, uh, where was that, Joshua? Yep. It was destroyed. And I was like, oh, there's Jericho. What's it doing in the text? So anyway, that's where they waited. And it was just like an in-between place kind of from where they went uh, to meet. 
Uh, so they waited there until their beards had grown back. When the people of Ammon, here's the people that were cursed, saw that they had made themselves stank. <laughs> <laughs> Repulsive, repulsive is what it says in the New King James, but in the King James it says stank. Yes, it says uh, they stank before they became David. a stench. Is hallelujah. Uh -huh. Stank is the word in the King James to David. The people of Ammon sent and hired Syrians of Beth Rehob and the Syrians of Zoba, twenty thousand foot soldiers from the king of Maka. 1,000 men, and from Ishtab, 12,000 men. So that's like 33,000 men total he sends. But look at this, the word stank, it, or repulsive, or stench, it means to smell bad. That's the first thing. Uh, and our sin does smell bad to the Lord, if it was looking at the type of Christ. It means to be offensive morally, or to be abhorred. All right? Think about that. If, if David is trying to honor uh, you know, another king that's died and honor his son and reach out and, and declare peace between his kingdom and the other kingdom and keep that peace. And then they would actually take the messengers or take the ambassadors and harm them and treat them shamefully to a king who is, who is I mean... Has, has got some great exploits before him. That's pretty crazy to do. So were they really declaring more? Were they really wanting to fight? Uh, was they already on the other uh, saying, let's just fight the guy and get it over with. I mean, I don't know what it is. But listen, we're born enemies of God. And unless the grace of God opens our eyes, we can't receive the ambassadors. We can't receive the ones that the king has sent. Unless it's with him opening our eyes. So, he hired these Syrians. And the word hired is this. Purchase temporarily. Isn't that interesting? Purchase temporarily. I think of the things that I did temporarily. And I purchased temporarily. When the hand of God was alongside me, convicted me of sin and righteousness and judgment. The favor of God was trying to reach out to me. And I was chasing drugs and alcohol and crime and all kinds of things, money in the world. And purchasing them temporarily to think that they could be my God. And that they could bring me peace. And that they would help me in my war that was going on. And they were only temporary fixes. When we go to the world and we go for help from the Syrians or anybody else, it's only temporary. It's not going to take care of the peace that you need. Only the favor of God, only the hand of the king, only reaching out and accepting peace, terms of peace, which is the blood of Jesus, the son of God, only accepting those terms with the king of kings and the Lord of lords is going to set you free. We'll see them at the end. They were purchased temporarily at the end of the chapter. They become servants. But Amon doesn't. Amon doesn't. So who'd they purchase? Let's keep looking. Verse 7. Now when David heard of it, he heard what was going on. Um... Now, he already knew about the beard and the garment, and so he's taking care of that at Jericho. And then he finds out from uh, his spies or the people that are watching that they're hiring some other people to help them. So he knows they're mounting an attack because they're hiring these Syrians, 33,000 men. Oh, here's some interesting things for you. Um... The Syrians means the highland. Beth Rehob uh, was the first Syrians they got. That means house of the street. Beth, oh, it's Beth Rehob. It means house of the street. I don't know if they're homeless. I don't know what it means. They, they didn't have no house. House of the street. Zoba. Syrians of Zoba means a station or two station. It's a region in Syria. Um... 
Ishtab means man of Tob, champion of Tob. So remember the champion of the Philistines that David already defeated? Death? It means champion of Tob or a husband. So what did David do? What did love do when he heard about it? What did beloved do? David, our king, he sent Joab. And Joab means Jehovah or Jehovah fathered. He sent Joab and all the army of the mighty men. I want to read about them mighty men. I can't wait to get there to talk about them. Then the people of Ammon, those cursed people, came out and put themselves in battle array at the entrance of the gate. And the Syrians of Zobah, one, Beth Rehob, two, Ishtab, three, and Maka, four. I forgot to tell you that Maka means depression. It means to press or to pierce from a word that means to bruise. Maka, depression. Isn't that interesting that those words mean that? Depressed. So anyway, I wanted to tell you, I think that, uh, and I don't know how yet, and I'm going to study it out, but I think Ezekiel 38 is hidden here. In Ezekiel 38, we have the war that's getting ready to go on right now in Syria, Damascus and Syria, where four Islamic countries are there with Russia. Here you have four Syrian countries there with Ammon, and, and, and they're getting ready to attack, or they want to attack. They're getting ready to attack over there. I don't know that we'll see it. I think the church will be raptured first personally. I don't know that to be true. Um, but I think that this is type of the same thing. All four of these tribes that come and are hired to help Amen are from the region of Syria, that whole region around. And, and as we talked about a couple of Bible studies ago, Syria is not really there anymore. Damascus is still there. It's the oldest city on the earth, I believe. And, um, but all the people that are there, they represent the region. Just like these here represent the region. There's four different regions. And we're going to get a fifth region here in a minute. But, and then there's Ammon. And right now, Russia is leading them four Muslim countries. And you can read about it in Ezekiel 38. They're still there. Uh, Russia and Iran are the two main players. Um, and so here we have it again, I think, on the pages here. And at first, we see that David doesn't go out himself. But he sends Joab, the commander of his army. Then the people of Ammon are there. And in 9, it says, When Joab, uh, Yahweh fathered, saw that the battle line was against him before and behind. See, he looks and he sees this in two different places. He chose some of Israel's best and put them in battle array against the Syrians. And the rest of the people he put under the command of Abishai, his brother. Now, these Joab and Abishai are both David's nephews. Abishai means father of a gift or it could even mean generous so he put uh, Joab is facing the Syrians and he took um, Abishai his brother and says now you go and fight against uh, uh, and set them against the people of Ammon then he said if the Syrians are too strong for me then you shall help me but if the people of Ammon are too strong for you then I will come and help you and I like that because, listen, we're supposed to put our shields of faith together in the body of Christ, right? And we're supposed to be generous, and we're supposed to be listening to what, uh, and be strong in the Lord, and we're going to see that in a minute. But we're supposed to have the one another ministry because the enemy is attacking. They're joining forces to attack the people of God, the favored of God, those that are the ambassadors of the king, and they want to cut us in half. They want to cut our beards and steal our authority. They want to cut our garments and have and steal our righteousness. And so he says this in 12. Be of good courage. Be careful with this, people. Listen. Be of good courage and let us be strong for our people. The King James says, play the men. 
And let us play the men for our people and for the cities of our God. And may the Lord do what is good in his sight or seemeth good. Listen, what's it mean to play the men? The men are supposed to be leaders. Men are supposed to be out front. Men are supposed to be leading the battle. Listening to God. But listen to me. There are those that will tell you today, oh, just suck it up. Be good. Have some courage. Be courageous. It's a big buzzword today in the church. Me and another gentleman was talking about it the other day. Listen, you don't have any courage of your own. Be strong in the Lord and the power of His might, we're told in Ephesians 6.10. You cannot be courageous by yourself. Notice that what Joab is saying. Uh, Joab means Jehovah Ye Father. Listen, be of good courage and let us play them in for our people and for the cities of our God. Notice who he's given the possession to. And notice who he's given the final outcome to. He's trusting in the Lord. The, 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 he's trusting in God Almighty. And may the Lord do what is good in his sight. And he always does what's good. He always does what's right. He's not taking courage and telling people to be strong in their own strength. He's saying, you're a child of God. Fight for God. Stand for God. Play the men for God. But look to God's strength and God's power. Take courage in what God is doing. Because the King has sent us. Don't be courageous in yourself. That's, that's flesh. Everything that we do has to come with dependency of God. I don't have any strength. I don't have any power. I don't have any courageousness in me. Unless it comes from the promises of God, the truth of God, the identity of God, the inheritance of God, from the throne room of God. And that's what he says. And may the Lord, he finally says, but not my will, not our will, but God's will be done. And may the Lord do what is good in his sight. He always does. All things work for good for those who are the called, for those who, I mean, all things work for good for those who love God and are the called according to his purpose. Not according to a war you want to fight. Not according to a way you want to fight. Not according to what you want to do. But according to what God is doing is the final. Look at this. Because His ways are always best. He always has our best and our favor in mind. You know, you and I will choose something and choose to be courageous and choose to be strong and stand on a hill where we're going to die at in our flesh. We choose it because of temporal quick fixes, but God is choosing and making every decision based upon eternity and getting you across the finish line. He's not making those decisions based upon each moment just because your heart is fickle. Because So that sometimes in order for God to do what's good in his sight, he allows you to lose. He allows you to fall. He allows the enemy to teach you something because you learn really good when you fail. You learn how to be crippled when you fall. You learn how to stop depending upon your strength when it hurts. And you learn how to be dependent and trust God for his goodness in the land of the living. And that's what he wants us to do. To be cripples that sit at his table. So Joab says some amazing stuff here. But he's not telling these people, fight for the city. Fight for our land. He's telling them to be courageous in the Lord. And to trust that God's going to do it. And we can stand and play the men. Listen, because God gets all the strength. Where are the men who are going to stand up and be lovers and learners and leaders for God? You can trust God. You can be courageous in his power and in his might. You have his authority. You've been clothed in his righteousness. And we need to stand up and go and let God fight the battle. Watch it. Watch it. All they did was show up. Watch 13. So Joab, Jehovah fathered, and the people who were with him drew near for the battle against the Syrians, the purchased temporary help and they fled before them 
Does you see the word that? courage mean the same thing as value? Yes. Okay. Courage means to behave self valiantly. Courage means to, to fasten upon. Listen, you got to fasten upon something. Where are you getting your courage from? You fasten upon the Lord and His will. You fasten, fasten your courage, your, your, your mind upon what God is doing and where your strength comes from. To behave valiantly because you're fighting for God in His cities and protecting His people. But when you begin to think it's yours, you're going, mine, 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 like a little child. Mm. You take courage in your strength and in your intellect and in your power and what you think your plan is and in, instead of looking to the plan of God. Thank you. Yes, because the King James says valiantly. No, it says courage, but then I got to think of the Lord also. It says valiant and elsewhere in the scripture. So uh, It means to behave valiantly. God's men were valued. Notice what they did. They didn't have to fight. The battle is the Lord's. All you have to do is be strong in the Lord in the power of His might and stand. They showed up. Joab and Abishai, back to back, facing the enemy on both sides with a line. And they behaved valiantly, standing, being courageous for God. Because it was God's city, it was God's people. They were listening to the king who sent them as an ambassador. And they fled before them. It says, the word fled means to flit or vanish away. It means to flee. They didn't, it doesn't even tell us that they had to raise a sword up. Or to pull a bow back. Or throw a rock or whatever they were doing at the time. It says they drew near for the battle against the Syrians and they fled before them. When the people of Ammon saw that the Syrians were fleeing, they also fled before Abishai and entered the city. So Joab returned to the people of Ammon, returned from the people of Ammon, and went to Jerusalem. He goes back to the king. He didn't even have to fight. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? Pretty amazing. And let's finish up. When the Syrians saw, say that about three times, that they had been defeated by Israel, they gathered together. Isn't that what happens always? The enemies gather together. The church separates. The devil has us decimated and separated. We're not in fellowship so that we can understand worship. I was playing with that word yesterday. Fellowship. And then worship, I was saying worship, like with a A, W A R, worship, because in worship is how we win the war. As we worship God, that's how you win the spiritual war. So it's worship. I'm going to start saying it that way. Uh -huh. Is that kind of like worship? Worship, that's how I say it. <laughs> I'm from Kentucky. So look at this. The Syrians, they seen that they're defeated. They gather together. Then Hadadzer, Hadadzer, Hadadzer means Hadad is my help, sent and brought out the Syrians. More Syrians coming. This is from over by the Euphrates. He sent and brought out the Syrians who were beyond the river, beyond the Euphrates, and they came to Helam. Helam means fortress. And Shobach, Shobach means from a thicket. And Shobach, the commander of Hadadezer's army, went before them. When it was told David, notice this, remember last time David heard, David heard last time. This time it was told David. He gathered all Israel, crossed over the Jordan. Yarden? Is that what it says in your Bible? Yarden? Yeah. The Yarden? Instead of the Jordan, it's Yarden. Um, listen to this. He crossed over the Yarden and came to Helam, which is the fortress. And the Syrians set themselves in battle array against David and fought with him. Now listen to me. I don't know if this is 
the second coming. But he gathers all Israel, which is those governed by God. And the word Jordan means descender. He descended. It could be a type of the second coming. I don't know. But we know there's another Syrian team now. And here's what I believe that the Bible means for the battle of Armageddon in the valley of Jezreel. I believe that the enemies right now on the planet are being led by obviously spiritual forces, the devil. They don't, some of them don't know what they're doing. And it's communism and Islam joined together in America, trying to destroy America to keep them from, uh, so that they can bring in one world government. And in Syria or the region called Syria, you have the same thing, Islam and communism. And they have to have an end game. Once they begin to fight, they got to say, well, who's in authority then? Because now you have two different factions again, Syrian and Amon, two different factions. And they have to decide. And so what happens that many people believe is that when the church comes back on white horses with Christ to rescue Israel, that the two parties that are there are gathering in the Valley of Jezreel to fight each other for world dominance. And when Christ comes, they have to join together again really quick to try to defeat Christ. And that's when the blood is up to the bridle of the horses and they're defeated in the Valley of Jezreel or Megiddo, the Valley of Armageddon. But they're really getting ready to fight each other for world dominance. And then they go, oh no, Christ! And they, and they have to turn on him and that's when he defeats them all. So I don't know if that's what's going on, but notice the first time David sent Jehovah fathered, he sent Joab, and didn't even have to fight, they just stood there. And now the second time, after another group of Syrians comes in, another big player, I don't know who that is, then David comes himself. David is a type of Christ. He comes himself and defeats them thoroughly. Look at this. He gathers all Israel, all those governed by God. He crossed over. He descended and came to the fortress. And the Syrians set themselves in battle array against David and fought with him. The Syrians fled before Israel. Fled again means uh, vanished away. And David killed 700 chariots, seven is the number of completion, 40,000 horsemen, 40 is the number of judgment, of the Syrians, and struck Shobach, he's the commander of the army, remember him, who died there. Don't know if that's a, I, I, I'm not even going to guess, never mind, it's too high for me. And when all the kings who were servants of Hadadzer saw that they were defeated by Israel, they made peace with Israel and served them. So the Syrians were afraid to help the people of Ammon anymore. Now that's what was happening on the scene. Ammon had no more help. They were cursed. They didn't get, they didn't hire any more temporary help. Uh, but there's a big battle going on there. And I believe that, that the, the New Testament is hidden in the Old Testament. So I believe we, that the types are there to help us understand what's going on and he gives eyes to us. He gives ears to us. And, the, and if you listen to what the Spirit is saying to the church, you're going to be led by the Spirit. And a lot of people don't understand what walking in the Spirit is or being led by the Spirit is. It's basically being dependent upon God. First for life and godliness and salvation. By believing the testimony of the Spirit of God who convicts of sin and righteousness and judgment and reveals to you that Jesus is Lord and God raised Him from the dead. You come to salvation. And you come back underneath the authority of God and you stop saying no to God. And then He begins to guide you and lead you and teach you. And you're coming and being dependent upon God through the power of the Holy Spirit and you're looking to him for everything that pertains to life and godliness and that's really walking in the spirit you're saying what do I do now oh what's that about how do I deal with that give me wisdom for this moment and you're learning to trust in the spirit of God instead of the spirit of this age you're learning to trust in the strength of God instead of your flesh and you're becoming crippled and eating at his table the whole time you do it 
and eating the bread of life, which goes in and it's good medicine and it turns our heart toward home and it turns our heart toward God and it makes us a people who have a heart like King David did, a man after God's own heart. And that's really what we want is to be people after God's own heart. And I believe the heart of God is Christ. I believe he sent his heart down there. And we see the heart of God in the face of Christ, in the person of Christ. So keep searching the scriptures. Keep looking. Read ahead. Uh, The next page makes it hard to make David a type of Christ because the next story is going to be the one that everybody talks about with David is, is the great falling with Bathsheba. But it helps keep him in a place where we can see him just like who we are, where we fall where we fall when we get our eyes in the wrong place and we end up having to cast ourselves back upon the Lord and ask for forgiveness because we know that's the only place our help comes from. So read ahead and uh, memorize 1 John 1, 9 for next week. Father, we thank you for the testimony of the Old Testament, for the examples of, And we pray, Lord, that we would learn through them, from them. We would take them to heart and we would hear what your spirit says to the church. And you would help us not to hire anything else temporarily to help us fight the war. We have no heart for war. Lord, we want to stand in your victory because we know the battle's over with. And we can rest comfortably in our Papa, in our Abba Father's arms. And in your finished work on the cross by the blood, the atoning sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you. Thank you for life and that more abundantly. Thank you that we are children in your house. Thank you that we can eat continually at your table and abide and continue and remain and stand in the victory of your son, Jesus Christ. Protect us, Lord. Pour out your spirit. And help us, Lord, to understand what fellowship is, a dependency upon you is, what the word is, the truth. And help us, Lord, to come in prayer boldly to your throne of grace, to obtain mercy and grace to help in time of need. Lord, we pray for salvation of souls in this area and that your people would wake up. In Jesus' name, amen. The Lord bless you. You too.